Everybody had a good Thanksgiving break. We have a little bit more to go, right? Just a little bit more. So here's the plan. This week, we'll have a quiz, the last quiz, that includes everything after, what was it? Expected values, in the quiz three. So everything after that is could be part of this quiz. Same format, six questions, half an hour, 10 points each. There's a homework due on Wednesday, right? Wednesday night, uh, I'll be there at office hours on Wednesday, uh, but the homework was not that hard and you guys had a lot of time for it. So uh, hopefully that, that's gonna go smooth. Uh, next, uh, you also have the station paper from before Thanksgiving that if you want participation points for, um, you have to give it back to us, the TAs, to look at it. Uh, you can do that this time this week, that's fine. If you, if you attempt most of the problems, you get a participation point. There was an additional paper that's not for participation points, just practice problems. Those are much harder problems that happen on a Sunday before Thanksgiving. Um, that's only for the people who really want to be challenged mathematically. Homework 6, there is a ho written homework 6. Uh, th there is a written homework six that's gonna be um, up on about Wednesday, Thursday, and that's you have about uh, I don't know um, ten days or so to do it. I'm, I'm drafting that one, so that should be fine. Uh, and then we have next week we'll have regular recitations, the same thing that always has happened: a paper, exercises, problem solving. But because the, there's a little hookup with the Thursday, uh, Northeastern University has some rule about that day, and I can't call it recitation. I'm not allowed, okay? Um, it, it has to do with you have to have a day off, and I don't want to give you the day off. Okay? <laughs> For the Thursday people, Wednesday people, I can, I can do anything I want on Wednesdays, but not on that Thursday. But we'll do the same that we always done during the recitations. We'll just call it something else. Okay. Um, to be legal. And then we have a final, don't miss it, on December 11, I think that's a Monday, right? Um, and most important in this list, you've got an email saying trace evaluations, right? Did we get a hands up who's got that email? Good. That means you have to evaluate me and the course as a whole. Uh, now, why is this so important? First of all, the course you are getting is the result of the, what we've done over the last 12 years, but also the result of everything the students said in those trace evaluations over the past 12 years. So what you say will be incorporated into the next courses, okay? We do pay attention to what students say. Um, now, some of you like it, some of you didn't like it, some of you have good things to say, bad things to say. It's very important to be honest in that. You should say the good and the bad things. Uh, keep in mind that this is the honor section. The mandate of this section was to push forward as much as possible into the math. So the comments, the only comments that are generally ignored is that people saying, I did not belong to the honor section in, in essence. Somebody saying why why the other section did this and that when I, I needed more help with my, my quiz. That 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 kind of comment means you should have been in the regular section, you know? So that that's honor section cannot scale back because that's a mandate of the honor section. The regular section can scale back. If they teach too much and too fast, they can scale back. But Please, evaluate everything. There's a lot of questions in there about the course, about the materials, the lectures, the homeworks, presentations, me, how did you feel interacting with the TA, so on and so forth. All those things we look at, we have a meeting at after the exam, final exam, and we incorporate everything into what's the plan for the next time when we teach the class. That being said, we need to move on for today. What do we have? Today we're going to talk about recurrences. <coughs> and about order of growth.
and more induction. It's an induction tool, as in that's what we're going to use more. Uh, so we already shown uh, informally what recurrences are and how they work. But it's important to understand how that works from computer science perspective, not just the mathematical perspective, right? So mathematically we say, here's the recurrence. T of n is 2t n by 2 plus n. We, we already put this on the board like three, three times or so. And we already solved this recurrence, right? But in a, in a computer science sense, uh, we think T is running time of an algorithm on input size n. Now, in this case, the algorithm here is what algorithm generates this kind of running time. How did we get at this recursion? Any recursion is particular to some way of solving a problem, right? And this was the algorithm what? How did I get this recurrence? Two to the k. Hmm? You start with two to the k. What algorithm was like, if you want to solve a problem of size n, you solve two problems of size n by two, and you have a n. Mercer. Mercer. So how does that go? Where, where is that coming from? D of n is the runtime for input size n. And then we say that's 2 t of n by 2. This is the 2 times runtime of input size n by 2. <coughs> Plus, where is this n coming from? We have to remember how merge sort was actually working. We're solving, say, merge the left side. That was one of these. Merge the right side. And then? The actual merge. Merge. So this is the runtime of the merge procedure. So in, in, in computer science, most, in, most of the algorithms that are not trivial are called divide and conquer, right? So in general, in computer science, we have divide <coughs> and conquer algorithms. That means solving a problem. This is the runtime for solving problem of size n. Is a bunch of uh, things here. I'm going to say, say, uh, A and A, and B and Z. This is solving <laughs> sub-problems of sizes, and A and B and C, plus <laughs> some F of N. This is the runtime for <coughs> combining sub-problem results. Merge sort, that was merging the two halves. That's a very general strategy for how computers work. In many, many cases, you see that the, the algorithm, the solution to solve a problem, is to break it into some smaller problems each one of these, each n, a, n, b, all these are smaller than n. So it says solve a bunch of sub-problems. And once you know how to do those, and you solve those, you have the solutions. And you somehow combine these solutions to get the solution for the big problem. A lot of the computer science you guys are going to do, in particular in algorithms, when you study these mechanisms, you're going to come down to 
how do I think of solving the problem? I implement a solution, a schema, kind of like that. Um, so let's do another one. Um, before I erase this, let me say something about this uh, trace evaluation, something that we the instructors don't like but unfortunately happens all the time. It's like movie reviews. We get a lot of ones and a lot of fives. You know? So when you fill those trace evaluations, it would be great. if. If, if a bigger sample fills those things, so we don't get just the ones and the fives. That's how, what happens to the movies. People say, uh, you know, I didn't like the movie, I didn't like the movie. People who feel like, ah, they, they didn't say anything. So then the reviews are very biased. Uh, we like to avoid that if possible. Uh, so for the people who don't feel terribly good or terribly bad about this course, please say that. Go to trace evaluation and say, I feel normal. He is normal. The course was normal. <laughs> nothing, nothing outrageous happened, you know? So uh, it's a 3.5 out of 5, in my, you know? Be honest. Normal is good, right? <laughs> nothing wrong with normal. Okay, how about um, binary search? How did that went? We also put this recurrence two, three times on the board already. While T of n, that's the runtime of binary searching an array of size n. Right? That's runtime for input size n. How did we do binary search? What's the algorithm doing? Yes. Split, split in half takes how much time to split in half? One. One. <coughs> Plus, then? <laughs> so in merge sort, I go both sides, right? I have to do the left side and the right side. That's why there's two subproblems here, right? These two comes from the fact that there is a merge sort recurrence on the left side and a recurrence on the right side. Each one of those, this is effectively same as saying this is the left side plus the right side. T of n by 2 plus T of n by 2, left side, right side. In binary search, do I go on both sides? Only one side, right? So what do I write here? It's one side, and then the size of the problem once I go on the recurrence on that side is what? N over 2. N over 2, because it's only half. <coughs> so this is the split, and this is the half size array. <coughs> so again, a lot of algorithms have this, um, <coughs> this, this flavor. <coughs> now, we did solve this. I don't want to solve those two again. Um, this one here, <coughs> if you remember, um, the typical way to solve the recurrences, mathematically speaking, is to iterate the recurrence few times until you find the pattern. Uh, I'm not gonna write this because, again, we did it twice, at least twice. The pattern in here for this, when you start with t of n is two t n by two plus n, the pattern was um, k n plus 2 to the k, t of n by 2 to the k, I think. Yeah. And then you figure out how deep, how, how far this pattern can go. So you have a stopping. Usually the stopping involves the fact that the, the inner term of t has to be around 1. n by 2 to the k approximately 1. That's the same as saying k <coughs> has to be log n. So then, for that k, which is the last k, sometimes you're gonna see this being last k, uh, then this becomes, if I replace k with log n, log n times n, that's this part, plus two to the log n t of one, 
Of course, it's of one because that's what's my criteria to stop when this inside of T becomes one. And this is then n log n plus n times T of one. The order which we so far we said informally, we care about how big this function is, how much does it grow. This is an n log n term and an n term. The order is n log n. In here, if I have this around here somewhere, do we have a pattern for binary search? Well, if I iterate this, so the first time is one plus that. If I iterate it again, what do I get? One plus, suppose I apply the recurrence on t of n by two now. What's that gonna be? I don't need this one here. It's gonna be one plus, if I apply the recurrence here, it's t of n by four, right? Because that's applying the recurrence, just not in argument n, in argument n by two. So if I replace here, n can be any number, right? So I replace n with n by two, I get one plus t of n by four. So that is two plus t of n by four. If I apply it again, I'm gonna get two plus, not two, sorry, there's no two here. One plus t of n by eight, right? Applying the recurrence again. So that is three plus t of n over <coughs> eight. What's the pattern? Anybody see a pattern here? If I do this k times, what am I gonna get? Hmm? K plus? T, uh, t of n over 2k. So 2k. That's the pattern. If I apply k <coughs> times, I get this kind of pattern. What's the last k that I'm gonna put in there? The same condition, I want n over 2k to be around one, which means that's the inside of t, which means k is the same like there. It's about log n, log base 2n. So then uh, for that last k, I'm gonna get log n, that's the k, plus t of one. How do you follow me here? Okay. Where is this log n coming from? That's the k, the last k, right? It's log base 2 of n. And t of 1 is because that's how I pick the k so that the inside of t is 1 here. Okay. Have any questions about this? This is the way we, we attend recurrences. And even if we don't solve it quite complete, those two are completely solved this way. But there's some that are more complicated. That's the right way to understand how, how the recurrence usually goes. So a few iterations are a very good idea just to get a feeling for where the recurrence, where, where the formula goes. So this order is gonna be what? Log n, right? Because this is a constant. In these running time recurrences, we don't care the value of t of one. What, what's the value of t of one? It's not like in Fibonacci. Fibonacci we had very exact starting values, F0 and F1 were very well defined. In here, we say there is some running time for an array of size one. We don't know what that is. Whatever it is, it's a constant, T of one. We care about this order of growth. How fast does it grow? This is a logarithmic growth, okay? Um, so what I wanna do about recurrences is to say, um, few things. First of all, we care about order of growth. Not exact values. Because ultimately, order of growth is gonna tell me how slow my algorithm is. This is gonna be a logarithm kind of running time. It doesn't matter if it's logarithm times a constant or plus a constant, it's like, <laughs> logarithm running time. This is gonna be n log n running time. Again, may have a constant in the front, may have some <coughs> other <coughs> operations that are uh, plus something. We don't care about that. We care about how big the function grows. 
So, um, and we have D of one, D of two. I'm gonna call them like the induction base cases, uh, which um, are constants. But again, we don't care about the exact values of what is T of one, T of two, T of three are. Uh, and we usually we assume T of n is monotonically increasing. Because being running time of an algorithm, we assume that the bigger the input is, n, n is the input of the problem, right? This is the problem input size. The bigger the input size is, the more time it's going to take to solve that problem. So most of those T of n functions are growing somewhat uh, monotonically. So if I'm to look at graphically, now it's time to define this order of growth. What do we mean by it? Mathematically speaking, so far we've been talking informally. This is like n log n. That's like logarithm. There was another one that was like n square. W what does it mean? We have a function f. So monotonically increasing means the functions I care about, they're going to go up. Right. All the functions I care about here, all those T of n's, are functions that are going up. So here's f, some running time. Uh, so that's some function, you know. It, I didn't plot the monotonically increasing because in the beginning, who knows what happens, but generally it's monotonically increasing. And here's another function, g. How do I say what's the growth relationship between f and g? I don't mean to say maybe in here there's a certain point where f is you know, smaller than g, and maybe there's another point here, just one point where, where f goes down or something. That could happen. But I don't care about those isolated incidents. I care about the trend towards the right side. So order of growth is the general trend on the right side. That's informal, right side. Formally, right side means when n goes to? That's n here. That's infinity. So what order of growth means, how this plays out on the right side? What's the behavior between, say, two functions? Yes? F is growing faster. What? F is growing faster. Right, but we need to define more concretely <coughs> what faster means. It's faster, but kind of the same faster or a lot faster? Is there a point after, like after which uh, one of the functions is not more than a constant times one of the other functions? That's the one. That's the relationship we're looking for. So there's a bunch of them. That's one of them, but we we have five in here. Right? There's a big table. So let's um, let's just um, look at that table and say what are the relationships that we actually I don't know the board. So one relation is um, F, you see, I need five spots here. <coughs> so one relationship is, um, we're going to say F is big O of G. That's not the case in there. And uh, let's call this big O. as a name. Um, and that says, informally, it means F growth <coughs> um, no more than G. That's not the case in here, the way I, I plot it up, right? Um, 
the other case that the one we have there is f is omega of g, which says um, f grows at least as much as g. That's the case that we have here. F, if you look at the pattern on the right side, F is at least as big as G. Right? Um, we have F equal theta of G, which stands for F G grows the same, same growth. And then we'll have two more in a little bit. So let's call this big omega, big theta. In terms of notation, when somebody says big O notation, it means this. Now, mathematically, how do we write this? F is bigger than G. That, that's where Daniel's point comes into place. We say there is some constant that's positive and there is a starting point, I'm going to call it end start. Because see, the growth happens, the, the relationship we're looking for happens at some point. In, in here, it's the beginning. We don't know what happened before this end. But at some point, it starts having this behavior. And uh, for any end starting at the end start, We have f of n is at least as big as c times g of n. So this is saying f is at least as big as g. In those relations, there's always a constant that could be put anywhere in here. Because it may be 2 times g, or half of g, or 100 times g. All these constants don't change the order of growth. So C is usually up to us. We can pick, so we can pick C, we can choose C and N start. Those two things, uh, if we find a C and an N start for this is satisfying, we can say F is omega of G, is <coughs> bigger than G. The other one is the same thing. There is a C and N start. C has to be positive. <coughs> the relation here is that after the N start, we have F of N smaller than C times G of N. So this is saying with a constant <coughs> and a start point, we, with the start point doesn't have to be at the beginning. N start to be 20 or 50. It starts somewhere. This behavior is, again, characterizing the right side of the graph. So it doesn't matter what happened on the left side. It's saying f is smaller than some constant. Could be 3 or 4 or 5 or 20 or a million times g. Then it's big O of g. So just a quick parenthesis here. I'm going to show you this in a second again. When I say here this t of n, right? That was the t of n equal with this. And I've got at the very end, I got n log n plus, what was it? n times t of 1. What would I say in terms of that notation? I would say t of n is what of n log n? How is my t of n compared to n log n? Is it smaller? <coughs> is it bigger? Can I say it's at least n log n? <coughs> Remember, omega means at least n log n? Yeah, because it's n log n plus something, right? After some starting point, but the beginning may be bumpy, but after that, is that. But can I say it's at most n log n? Can I say that? Can I say this, this function, I got this t of n approximately this. Is this? O of n log n or not? <coughs> Why not? 
Because you're adding n times two at one Yeah, point. but I can add a constant, remember? I can have a constant here. I can choose a constant. Oh, yeah. So can I choose a constant? Let's go back there. Can I choose a constant? What would this mean if to, for this to be true? That would mean exactly what? T of n has to be smaller than a constant times n log n. But T of n is who? That's why T of n. T of n is n log n plus n times T of 1. Can I find a constant that satisfies this relation? Are you guys sure? I cannot find a constant that satisfies this relation? No, you can. Huh? No, you can. What constant? So big. Hmm? I don't know the. You have to choose a value. I can find C equal to. We, I need to make absolutely sure everybody sees every single one of you before we move on. If I pick C equal 2, I get 2 n log n on this side. That's two oranges. <coughs> and on left side, I have orange. one orange. So that comes down to n log n bigger than n times <coughs> t of 1. Is that something that I can satisfy? Is, isn't n log n bigger than n times t of 1? So. I can pick any constant I want that's positive. <coughs> Two, three, five, a hundred, a million if I want to. The point is, something times n log n, it's going to eventually be n log n plus an or smaller order. This n times t of 1, it's smaller order than n log n. So two oranges, or three, or four, or five, are going to beat an orange plus something smaller than the orange. That's how you have to think of this. This is a dominating term here, n log n. That dictates the order. So if I add smaller terms to it, I don't increase the order. Because I can choose a constant that's 2, or 3, or 5, and then that side is going to be bigger than this side. Hands up, who's follow me on this. Okay. So every time you see a sum of two or three terms, if you know which one is the bigger order, that's definitely not being increased by adding smaller terms. The reason is this constant. I choose this constant big enough to cover for the orange n plus the remaining terms, like c equal 2. So this t of n here, it's both bigger than n log n and smaller than n log n. So we're going to have a notation for that. This is the notation. And here we have two constants. And here we have <coughs> f is smaller than c times n uh, times g of n and bigger than d times g of n. So for every n after the start. So what this is saying, f is very close to g in the sense that I can multiply g with some constant. Maybe this c is 2 or 3. And maybe this d is 1 half. And I get f in between those g's. How would that look? Here's g times that d <laughs> constant f. And here's g again times the other constant, which is bigger. My constant c is bigger than d. So if I get g times d in here and g times c in here, c and d are constants. So you can only choose them once. You can choose any constants you want with a condition that you cannot change your mind. So once you pick c equal 2 and d equal 0.01, then that's it. C and D cannot change. So that's saying F 
has the same growth as G, both, <coughs> both up and down, which is this notation, theta. And the relation is F is between some constants of G, both sides. So here's an example. How about this one here? What's the order, log n? So I could say P of n, can I say this? Is theta of log n? This is log n plus a constant, right? The actual result, P of n, is log n plus a constant. Can I say it's theta of log n? Effectively, what would that mean? This means P of n is log n plus a constant, P of 1. That has to be between C, a constant of log n, and another constant of log n. Is that true? Can I pick C and D such that log n plus T of 1? I don't know who T of 1 is, some T of 1. Maybe it's 125.38. I don't know. To be smaller than C log n and bigger than D log n. What, what constants would you pick? What would the reason about C be here? Big C equal two, is that what you're saying? Uh, yeah. C equal two? I think it's saying two log n, two oranges, is gonna be the orange plus a fixed amount. Yeah. Because the fixed amount won't matter long long run. And P equal one. <coughs> because one orange is smaller than an orange plus. All those T's are positive and monotonically increasing. Right? So I can pick any constants I want with a condition that I don't change them. So in all these proofs, you have to say, okay, I'm picking C equal five, C equal seven, C equal two. I'm picking some C that would make my proof work. And you can pick any positive C if that works all the way across the problem. You can't ch change your mind to part B or say, okay, now I'm changing my C because my induction step doesn't work. You can't do that. Once C is picked, it has to stay picked. <coughs> How many people understand this? F and G grows the same way because F is bounded by a C times constant. I could have picked C a different C. I could have picked C equal 20 if I wanted to. And I get 20 oranges bigger than an orange plus something. Or I could have picked D equal 0 0.001. It would be one of a thousand of log n. It's smaller than log n plus. As long as they're constants and positive, that's fine. So those are the three big notions that you absolutely must know. This is saying F asymptotically. Asymptotically means on the right side. So the right side is when n goes to infinity, it's called asymptotic. And people say, what happens in asymptotic behavior on the right side? They don't mean that f was a little bit smaller than g at some point, one time. One time is tolerable. Two times is tolerable. Three times is tolerable. Few times is tolerable. As long as I find some starting point after which I get the behavior I want, this n start is also up to me. I can choose n start to be 200, 300. Whichever n is convenient <coughs> to say after that n, I get my behavior. <coughs> so this n is the same like the constants. You can choose it once. You can say, I'm going to say this behavior <coughs> happens starting at n equal 25. Fine. But then it has to start after n equal 25 has to happen all the time. This relation. We have two more that are a little bit more tricky. What if f is O of g? So this is big O, this, guess what this is? Small or little O. So this is kind of saying the same. This is saying f is not more than g, right? So g is kind of an upper bound, right? If you think about it this way, 
Uh, this serves as G being the upper bound of F. And this is like G is the lower bound. This is saying my algorithm, the running time F, it's going to be at least n log n steps, asymptotically speaking. This is saying my algorithm is going to be at most n log n steps, asymptotically, maybe a constant in there, three times n log n. What this is saying, it's the same as O. It's saying F is definitely smaller <coughs> than G. So the difference between big O and small O is that in this case, F could be approaching G. Because we said no more than G, that means definitely less than G or same as G. N log N is O of N log N. Or N squared is O of N squared. Right? Because the condition here is F cannot beat G. In here saying F cannot approach G. So F has to be all the time definitely smaller than G. So how the plot look for this? Where would I get an F and G to work that way? I have an F function. Here's my F. How G have to look like to be definitely bigger? Like it can't be within a constant of F. What kind of function G would be definitely bigger than F? Something like that. My F function I mean, right, it goes kind of like this. right? And G starting at some point, everything starts at some point. It doesn't matter the left side. As long as after one point, G takes off. Like it's not anywhere close to F anymore. Definitely bigger. So we say here, G definitely bigger. As in, they, they're not close to each other by a constant. So how do we write this? How do we say F is smaller, but it doesn't come within a constant of G? So F is smaller, and F does not approach C a constant times G. How can we write this in a math form? So we, we need some sort of defi mathematical <coughs> definition for what this is. Of course, it's going to be F is smaller than something times G, right? F is smaller than C times G. That, that's what we mean, smaller. There's got to be a starting point. And this happens for n starting at that point. We, again, like before, we, we don't care about the left side. We only care about some behavior to the right. But what about this constant? We say f cannot approach g. What, what, how would I say that? So let's find an example. This f, this could be. Um, n log n, 3 n log n plus 5 n. 3 n log n plus 5 n. And this g could be n to the cube. Is that true? Is that correct? It's not only 3 n log n plus 5 n is smaller than this. It will never approach n cube. n cube is just a different order than this. Right. So whatever constant you try to put in, this function will never get within a constant <coughs> of n cube. Because n cube is just too big. I can pick the constant being a billion here, a billion times this, eventually still going to be significantly lower than n cube, because n cube has a much faster order of growth. Now, the bigger the constant I pick, the more the n star can move to the right, because I need bigger n's to make it happen. But that's OK. n star can be a anywhere down the right side. So what do I have to say here? This has to be true, of course. But who's C? For any C. 
So that says, even if you pick a C that is infinitely small, 1 over 10 to the 7, 10 to the 20, a very small C, that will look, make this right side very small, right? If I pick C 0 0.0000000, keep going, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, isn't that side very small? Right? The right side? What this is saying, even with that small C, F eventually loses to G. So that what happens here. Even if I choose G, C, I'm picking a C here that's very small, 10 to the 10. And that's my C. Even with that such a small C, eventually n cubed times this constant, which has a lot of zeros after the dot, is going to beat this function. Because n cubed just grows faster. Now, if I pick a small c, the n start, when that starts to happen, will move to the right side. I need n to be few billions. That's fine. I can move the n start. Eventually, the behavior is that this function is going to beat this function no matter what I do. So the difference between this is saying, here, it exists c, means you can pick a c. You choose your c the way you want. And here, if you want to prove something like this, can you pick a C? No. You have to show that no matter who picks the C, this eventually happens. Eventually, I mean after some n. You can still pick the n stat. The right way to say this, though, which is incorrect here, uh, this is incorrect, is that n start have to be after c. Why is that? This is back to logic module 2. What does it mean to say exist n start and for every c blah blah blah? Versus to say for every c there is an n start blah blah blah. What's the logical <coughs> difference between those two statements? Yes? Is it if you put that there exists an n start before for every c it suggests that the n start is the same? It's fixed first, so you can't change it. Yeah. And if I put it after? It can change. For, for every C, I can pick a different end start, which is essential, right? If somebody picks a very small C, I need to pick a very big end start, right? So it can't be a definite end start that works for every C. But for every C, there could be an end start. So the right way to write, to write this is in order of choosing. First, somebody picks a C. I have no control over that. But I can choose an end start to make this work. And uh, the last one is small omega, which is the same like in here. So small omega, this omega is going to look like a W. Uh, this F definitely beats G or bigger than G, <coughs> definitely bigger than G. <clears throat> so what this means is, again, no matter who picks the constant, I can find some starting point, and after that starting point, I get F to beat C times G. So as an example, <coughs> what happens if, uh, say, f <coughs> is n cubed plus 2n minus 5 plus 2 log n, and g, f of, this is f of n, and g of n, is 2 to the n. What can I say? Can I say f is O of g? Is f bounded by g grows no more than g? That would be equivalent with finding some c and some n0 such that f of n is smaller than c times g of n 
where n is bigger than <coughs> 0. Right? Can I find such a c that 2 to the n becomes bigger than f of n after some point? What's the reason? Why is this always possible? Yes. You, would, you could end up with a higher order eventually. Right, so that is n cubed plus 2n minus 5 plus 2 log n smaller than some constant times 2 to the n. The reason for this is possible is that this is an exponential function. And this is a? What kind of? About polynomial. The reason is not exactly polynomial is because of this log n. Formal is now polynomial. But in terms of order of growth, what's the order of growth of this expression here? N cubed. N cubed is a polynomial, right? Any exponential beats any polynomial. No matter the base, 2, 3, 5, 1.5, no matter the degree, 3, 4, 6, 7, 100 of the end. Polynomials will lose to exponentials. And you need a little calculus to prove that, but you can do it in high school calculus. I could say that, big O. But this big O means F could approach G. I'm allowing that possibility. When I say big O, I'm saying F is not bigger than G. Right? How about if I say F is small O of G? So this is big O. This is small. Is that true? Is this function always going to lose against the exponential, no matter what constant anybody picks? That's true. So that would be to say, for any constant, there is some starting point. And n cubed plus 2n minus 5 plus 2 log n, it's going to end up smaller than c times 2 to the n. We, if anybody is my adversary, it's going to try to pick a very small constant, right? To make my life hard. A small constant make my life hard. It doesn't matter how small this constant is. Even if it's 1 over 10 to the 100, eventually 2 to the n overpowers. Even times that small constant overpowers the rest of the function. Um, can I say, so that's true, that's true. Can I say f is about the same as g? That would mean there are two constants, and d times 2 to the n is smaller than n cubed plus 2n minus log n, da 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 da, whatever the expression was, minus 5, times c times 2 to the n. Right? That, that, that's what this means <coughs> if I say that. Now, this is it's easy. There's no problem finding a c such that 2 to the n times c beats that. That's easy. An exponential will beat the polynomial. But this in here is not true, not possible. The reason I cannot find this d is right here. Any constant, eventually 2 to the n times the constant is going to beat my function here. So whatever d somebody chooses, no matter how small I want, I can choose the d. That's true. I can choose a d very, very small, try to make this possible. The problem is, no matter how small I choose it, eventually the function 2 to the n times that constant beats my uh, polynomial here. Who's with me? Hands up. Good. You need some practice about this. I know it sounds like so easy when somebody says it to you. I cannot tell you how many mistakes I've counted on this, not just for undergrads, master students too. Because it sounds so easy, oh I get that. It's, it's like a piece of cake, right? Uh, people get lost into how these inequalities actually work. So you're gonna get a bunch of examples in the homeworks of who is bigger, what's the right relationship between two functions? What's the, the right relationship between f being n squared plus log n um, plus <coughs> n log n times 100, and g being 
1 over 100 n squared. What's the right relationship between those two? What's the order of this? So it's n squared plus log n plus n log n times 100. What's the order? n squared. What's the order of this? n squared. So what's the right relationship between? Is this one. They have the same growth. Because the constants don't matter. Once you have the n squared, the rest of the terms smaller than n squared, you can ignore them. And because both of them are n squared times a constant, constants don't matter, so they both <laughs> in the, within the theta range of each other. So now that we have these <coughs> orders of growth, um, I want to show you another thing that is an, um, an honor thing. I have a cheat sheet here. So this is A sub problems of size n by b each. And this is combination run back. Many relationships look like that. If you look at the patterns, the one you have in the homework, what's the one in the homework? Anybody remembers? Yeah. What is it? 8p of plus. Isn't that that kind with some particular a, b, and c? So I'm going to show you something that the other section doesn't have. <coughs> Master students do. There's a theorem that we don't prove. Because we prove it, we don't prove it, we can't use it. If you ever say, I got a theorem that cheat cheat and here's your answer, I'm going to say, you didn't prove the theorem, OK? So, <laughs> so we're not allowed to use it? Well, let me tell you what is allowed. Here's the, the cheat cheat. It says there are three cases. Either C is smaller than logarithm base B of A. In that case, the order of growth is theta of N at log B of A, log base B of A. That's case one. Or C could be equal with logarithm base B of A. In that case, the growth of this function is going to be n at that logarithm base b of a times log n, which of course, because log b of a is c, that's the same as n to the c times log n. And case number three, if c there's only one other possibility, C to be bigger than log B of A. In each case, T of N is grows like N to the C. That's the free term here. So we don't prove this theorem. It has a name. Master theorem for recurrences. Because how easy it would be to apply this theorem to get the answer for that homework question? Well, what is A, B, and C? A, a that's A. Who's B? Two. And who's C? Three. So what case am I in? How does log B of A compare to C? Two. How much is log base 2 of 8? How is C? Three. So which case is it? Two. Is this case here? So what's the answer to this problem? That, which is n to the three <coughs> times log base log n. So it's n three log n. There you go. I just solved the homework problem. Yay. <coughs> you can't use these as an answer. That's the catch. You can use this to guess the answer. 
Like, you don't show it to me like that. You don't say, hey, I apply master theorem. You apply master theorem to get the answer. So now you have the answer. You know where this is going. In recurrences, knowing where it's going, it's a big step forward. It facilitates whatever derivation, induction, any proof you want to make. So let me state that again very clearly. In this class, quizzes, exams, homeworks, whatever, this is not allowed. Even, you have to prove it. If you use this theorem <coughs> on that paper, homework, exam, you have to write the proof. And there's a proof, of course. It's three pages of math for this theorem. So if you don't write that proof, you get zero credit. But how you can use it is as a cheat sheet. I apply the theorem, I figure out the answer, and then I write my proof, like iterations or induction, to get to that answer. It's much easier when I know the answer. Now be careful, not all recurrences look like that. Is Fibonacci a recurrence that looks like this? Can I write Fibonacci in this form? No. How about binary search? What was binary search? <coughs> well, we just wrote it, right? One plus P of? Well, how much is A for binary search? B, C, Zero. how much is log base <coughs> B of A? More than zero. You sure? Yeah. No, it's zero. Is it? Yeah. All right, don't mind. So what case is binary search? Case two. So what would be the answer for binary search? N to the what power? Yeah. Zero times? Log N. N. So what is that? Log N. That's log N for binary search. You remember the other, uh, do, don't you have a tri, 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 ternary search or something like that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, what is that? Ternary search is one relationship. Isn't it log base? Huh? What, what is the recurrence for ternary search? Anybody solve that problem? Well, you split it to how many sub-problems? Three. Three. Each sub-problem of size? I know we're three. Uh-huh. <coughs> and uh, putting back together the results? Is it, is it, this is a search or sorting? Search. search. For search, we don't have three uh, sub-problems. Yeah. We only have one, right? Yes. Yeah, plus two. two. Two is the same as n to the zero in terms of, it's a constant, right? So applying the, the, the master theorem, will get you an answer here for A equal 1, B equal 3, and C equal 0. How about replacing merge sort with a sorting procedure that splits into five things? Or so. So merge sort split in five. Well, how would that look like? What's the recurrence? If I solve this problem, I, I have five sub-problems now. I split my array into five. Not into two like merge sort does, but into five. What's the side of each sub-problem? <coughs> N over 5, right? And the combination is still a linear term. That's something for the people who want to do something interesting. Why if I split into 5, my merge sort, not in 2? When I have those 5 parts sorted, when I put it together, it's still a linear type of operation. <coughs> so what is A here? B? C, <coughs> 1, right, n to the 1. What case log b, b of a, how does that compare with c? Equal. This case, right? So this whole thing is going to still be n log n. Master theorem, super hammer. This is a very powerful canon at all these recurrence problems. but. You cannot use it. <laughs> you gotta get to the master level. <coughs> you can use it as a cheat sheet. Nobody's gonna know how you guess the answer, right? You say, hey, I'm guessing the answer. It's n cubed log n. How about that, right? And then you still have to prove that's your answer, okay? But this is also a, a good way, even if you don't wanna guess, just to verify things really quick. If it fits that way, it gives you a very quick way to verify your answers.
You know, you do all that three pages of math and you come up with an answer, better verify with this theorem if you can to make sure it's not wrong. Okay, so let's do some examples of recurrences. Again, for the recurrences, we care about the order of growth. We, we don't care about the exact value. We, all we need is an order of growth. Um, so how about, um, what do we have here? This one. D of n is 2 d n by 2 plus n squared. I'm going to apply the poor method from before. Now I have a big canon. I could guess immediately what this recurrence is, right? A, B, C. Who's A, B, and C? 2. What case is it? It's case 3? Right? So the answer is going to be? N squared. Is it done? It's N squared. Well, but I can't do that, right? I know it's N squared, but I have to write the solution for the graders, right? Graders will give you zero points if you say master theorem. So, okay, uh, what, what that is, is N squared. I apply, remember what we did before? We say two, apply the recurrence again. This is N by two squared, right? Plus what? Two of N by four. That's applying the recurrence, again, iteratively, a second time, on the term n by 2. So I'm going to start writing n squared in the front, 1 plus. How many n squares are here if I deal with the 2s? How many? It's 1 half, right, remaining. It's 2 times 1 over 4, so that's 1 half, plus 2 n over 4. So let's do it again, 1 plus 1 half plus, I apply the recurrence, that's <coughs> n by 4 square plus 2 t of what? n over 8. Um, so how many n squares I have now? This is a four? No, no, no. Uh, one other one. Huh? Top right. Go top right. Four. Right, I have four of those, right? Because it was uh, two times two, four. So this is a four here. So then again, I, I group the n squares all together. I have one plus one half from before. How many n squares are here now? One fourth plus uh, eight p n to the eight. Right? Oh, can anybody guess the pattern here? <coughs> What's the general pattern of this? If I am to do it k times, n square one plus one half <coughs> plus one fourth plus. <coughs> One over two to the k plus. How does this two to the k compare? How does this four compares to the eight? If this is two to the k, this is <coughs> okay. Better write this as minus one then. And put this k here. Two to the k minus one to the k and over two to the k. Right? That's the general pattern. So what's the last k? k has to be, it's about log n, right, like before. To get t of 1 in here, I need k to be about log n. So for that last k, what do I get? n squared 
1 plus 1 over 2 plus 1 over 2 to the log n minus 1, right? 2 to the k, it's going to be n e to the 1. What is this? Has a name, remember from a few lectures ago? This is a kind of series, but it's a specific kind. What? It's not harmonic, because it's 1 over 2. In harmonic, it's 1 over 3, 1 over 4, 1 over 5. This is geometric. <coughs> what base has? What's the base in this series? The, the, the base that doesn't change. In a geometric series, the power changes. 1 over 2. So this is n squared. We know that you, this is sum for uh, i equals 0 to some log n minus 1 of r to the i, right? r being 1 half. This is 1 half at 0, 1 half at 1, 1 half at 2 until that. We know this. there's a formula for this, right? This is um, something like r to the log n minus 1 over r minus 1. plus n times d of 1. Now what's the order of this thing? You guys remember this formula? Sum of the r at some power starting from 0 is r at the next power. So this is log n minus 1. And this is log n. Minus 1 divided by r minus 1. Can you subtract 1 again? Yeah, you have to look back for that formula. It's r at the next power minus 1 divided by r minus 1. Anyway, it doesn't matter. This is a constant here, right? Or it's, it's, it's not a constant because of log n, right? But the reason it's like a constant is because what's going to, well, who is r? Well, r is smaller than 1, right? It's like a half. What happens with a half at a big power? It's going to become an insignificant term, r at log n, because r is below 1. If r would be bigger than 1, this would be significant. But with r, because r is smaller than 1, that means r at log n is going to be approximately 0. Eventually, this becomes insignificant. So this is some sort of 1 over 1 minus r, approximately 1 over 1 minus r. So then, what's the order of this? n squared times this quotient <coughs> plus n times t of 1. n squared. Because the constant doesn't matter. Again, any constant, as long as it's positive, it's going to be n squared. Um, now, this could get messy, like you can tell. Even this one, she's easy, gets messy a little bit. And you might get stuck in these calculations. But either with the master theorem or with these iterations, you could guess the answer without being able to completely do it. Now, if you guess it with master theorem, you definitely have to do something about it. If you guess it in here, suppose I get stuck in here, I don't know what to do. And I say, this to me looks like n squared. What can I do now to finish my proof if this calculation is not exact? It serves as a good guess, but I can't finish it up clean. What do I do? There's another way of doing this, which is what? Yes. I can do my induction. I say, this is a guess. I could have guessed it from master theorem direct. I say, how about proof by induction that t of n is smaller than c times n squared? That's effectively saying t of n is O of n squared, right? That's the definition of big O. Big O means there's a constant c, and that is smaller than c of n squared. <coughs> Right, 
So assuming this didn't work so well in terms of making clean calculate, if it does work well, this is an acceptable solution in this class. Mm -hmm. If you get what I wrote here and you conclude from here the order is n squared, you're done. <coughs> the problem is this term could be super complicated. And while you cannot do it exact, maybe you don't know the exact order, but you could guess it. So then, how can I do this? There's a base case or cases that you're going to have to figure out. I'm going <coughs> to skip those right now. Leave it for home exercises. What's the induction step? If I look at this recurrence, <coughs> the induction is going to go from where to where? You know, I have a hypothesis and a conclusion in the induction step. I'm looking at my recurrence and I say my induction is going to go from where to where? n over 2 to n. Right. So induction step n over <coughs> 2 to n. I, like always in induction, I write down what I'm, I'm trying to prove here. So what is I'm, that I'm trying to prove? If t of n by 2 is smaller than c n by 2, right, squared, then t of n is smaller than c n squared. That's my induction step. That if this worked for n by 2, it's going to work for n. So the induction goes now from n to n plus 1, or from n minus 1 to n. It goes for half to the whole. So is it a weak induction or strong induction? Strong. Strong. The only weak induction is from n to n plus 1, or from n minus 1 to n. Anything that's not like that, it's a strong induction. So how do I prove it? t of n by 2, t of n is 2 t of n by 2 <coughs> plus n squared, which I know from the induction hypothesis that's smaller than c of n squared plus n squared there, right? which is n squared times c over 2 plus n squared, which is n squared times 1 plus c over 2, which I'm going to put here want. Want means I don't know that's true. I want it to be true. That's smaller than c n squared. That's what I want, right? So I, that's what I've got, and this is what I want when this happens. What do I need this c to do for this relation to be true? This is true if 1 plus c by 2 is smaller than c, which is the same as saying c has to be smaller than 2. right? Oh no, did I get this right? I got it wrong a little bit. I need, that's true, I get 1 over c, 2 has to be smaller than c, right? That's what I need. <coughs> so how can I get 1 plus c over 2 to be smaller than c? What do I need for the c to be? When is this equal? <coughs> For what c do I get equality? 1 plus c over 2 is more equal to c. Two. So I need c bigger than 2 or smaller than 2? Which I can choose c that way, right? Remember, c is a constant. I can choose whatever I want. I can choose c equal to 200. So that's a simpler proof. Yeah, right? So this may be easier than doing this clean, but I need to know the answer. To make an induction proof, I need to know where to go with it. So how do I guess an answer? I either need to do something like this to guess the order, or to apply the master theorem to guess the order. Either way, I can do induction proof. This is only halfway because it proves the O bound. 
In reality, I can make another proof that's backwards. It's bigger than dn squared to get a theta bound, right? Because if I want to be, this is only showing it's not more than n squared, but the reality is that this function, it's exactly n squared. So it can be proven it's not more than n squared times a constant, but it's also not less than n squared time a, times a constant. So it's exactly theta of n squared. Questions? Yes. So if we do decide to use the last of the arm, we prove it using two of these, then we can yeah. use it. Yeah, you get the theta bound. In most cases, I think we care about the O bound, because <coughs> in computer science, we care about the worst case, what the upper bound is. If it's no more than n squared, that's all I need to know. If occasionally it's more than that, that's fine, right? I care about the worst case analysis. How um, about another one? Wait here. T of n is um, three T of n by three. I have here plus n. What is this going to be? If I apply the master theorem, am I going to be in this case here? Log b of a equal to c? Yes or no? Yes. So the answer would be that, which is going to be n times log n. Boom. I have a guess. n log n. Well, how about I don't run my guess. I run the... So my guess from master theorem is n log n. <coughs> but how about doing it. That's going to be what? n plus 3. Apply the recurrence again. n by 3 plus 3 times t of n by <coughs> 3 squared, right? Because I'm, I'm applying now the recurrence for this term, t of n by 3. So what do I get? And how many n's are here total? 2n plus 3 squared t over n by 3 squared. Apply the recurrence again, that's 2n plus 3 squared, n by 3 squared, plus 3 t of n by 3 cubed. So that is, how many n's I have now total? 3n. 3n plus 3 cubed, t of n by 3 cubed. Uh-huh. Can we guess a pattern? Kn plus 3 to the k t of <coughs> okay so last k is what log base 3 of n because that will give me the inside of the t to be 1 right if I choose log base 3 of n 3 at that power is n so then for this last k what do I get log base 3 of n times n <coughs> plus, of course, this is n times t of 1. What's the order here? When you write order, all logarithms are the same. In terms of order of growth, the exact function is log 3, but all logarithms have the same growth. The reason is logarithms are with a constant of each other. Any log base 3 of something is just log base 2 of that times a constant. Or log base 10 of that same something times a constant. Or log base e times a constant. Or logarithms are within a constant of each other. You, you, you should know that, that logarithm of base a of x is logarithm in base b of x times uh, log base b of a, I believe. So then, log base uh, A of B. So that's the constant between the two logarithms. Two logarithms having the same <coughs> x, x, that's the argument, two bases. They are within a constant of each other. So as far as order goes, it doesn't matter what I put here. 2, 3, 4, 5, 10, E, it's going to have the same growth, which is the n log n, which is the answer I had from here. What you should do today at home, 
is to say, okay, let's do another proof, which is by induction. So by induction, I don't want to do that proof now. We need to prove that this T of n is smaller than Cn log n. Uh, this, in this class, is an acceptable proof. If you do it this way and you got to n log n, that you're done. Because these terms are easy enough, I could just have 2 and 3 and 3 and I could figure it out, but sometimes this is too messy, that's why I need a different uh, way of doing it. So that's how recurrences grow, go, and unless the problem <coughs> specifies, I want something exact, we mean the order. When you say solve for recurrence, I give you a recurrence and I say solve it. I'm not asking for exact values. I'm asking for the order, like n log n, n squared, n cube log n, uh, whatever it is. I want the order, not the exact number. That's why we don't even specify t of 1. We don't specify a base because we don't care about the exact values, just how it grows, tendency on the right side. The one other recurrence that I'm interested in doing is quicksort. Anybody remembers how quicksort worked? So we remember quicksort <coughs> was an array, right? And the quicksort procedure was find the pivot, find the value v, so that's called a partition procedure, which makes a of p equal v correct value. And everything on the left side was smaller than B. Everything on the right side was bigger than B. So A of anything less than P is less than B. And A of anything more than P, P is a position. It's bigger than B. You guys remember this procedure? I was doing sorting. That's what I want. First, it calls this partition function, which finds a element, it puts it in the right spot in the array, and moves everything in the array smaller on this side, and everything on the array bigger on the other side. This, this is chosen at random. P is a random position. I have no control over whether this, I would like to be in the middle, but I have no control over where they're going to end up. How many people remember Quicksort? Good. How long is it going to take me to run this thing, partition? Pick a value and then move everything smaller on the left side and everything bigger on the right side. How many times do I need to traverse the array to do this? Remember we did this, we say if I get a value, we have, we have an example. I can traverse the array once, and every time I see a value, if it's smaller, I keep it on the left side. If it's bigger, I move it on the right side. That's going to be linear. In the, in the website, there is a link. If you click on it, searching procedure, sorting procedures, and you get the exact procedure function. It's not complicated. But then what do I need to do? This is not sorted, right? What do I need to do now? I've got the V, I've got the small values here, higher values here, but what do I need to, to do next? Yes. Sort the leftover. So call quick sort on array the left side, that's left. And then call quick sort the array of the right. Because now they're independent. This side has nothing to do with this side. I can solve them in parallel. Once this is in the right spot and the smaller values are here, sorting these values have <coughs> nothing to do with these values. Right? We get that about quick sort? So what's the running time recurrence? The time to solve this whole problem is going to be n for the partition function. 
for this procedure. Plus, how big is the left side? It's not guaranteed that this is in the middle. This P, it'd be nice to be in the middle, but it could be here, it could be here. How many positions are from here to here if P is in the right spot? P is in position P. How many positions are before P? And how many <coughs> positions are after P? <coughs> so this P is random, so that means on average I get something like right I don't know who P is I get this sum <laughs> And I get this is a probability. Probability to have a certain position which could be anything from 1 to n is 1 over n. This is I'm computing an expected value. Here. I'm saying I don't know who this p is. But there are so many possibilities, it's either 1 or 2 or 3 of n, and any one of these possibilities has equal chance of happening because p was be chosen at random. There are n possibilities, so it's 1 over n chance of each. Would this be a worst case analysis here? If I say with equal probabilities I have this happening, what, what kind of analysis is this? Average case. On average, this is going to happen. Of course, in quicksort, I'm lucky if this is in the middle, and I'm unlucky if this is on the sides. But being equal chance probabilities, I say on average, I get a 1 over n of everything. So this turns out to be 2 to the n sum of uh, k equal 1 to n minus 1. I have it here. I can say p. p of k. <coughs> plus n in the front. The reason is 2 to the n is that everything has been summed twice. These sums are the same terms. One is counting from 1 to n. The other is counting from n minus 1 to 1. But they're the same terms. It's summing up of t of everything in, in the middle. So that's why there's a 2 of the sum. So how do I solve this recurrence? This is a difficult recurrence. This is, does it look like master theorem to you, this thing? Is it look like A times N to the B plus N to the C? No. So how does it, uh, how, what do we do? We can start iterating it, but when we iterate, this, these sums here will be super messy. So what do we do about it? I'm going to apply um, a little trick here. And I'm going to say, um, what happens if I multiply with n? n times t of n <coughs> is going to be n squared plus 2 sum from p equal 1 to n minus 1 of t of p. Sorry, that's p. I took the relation and I multiply with n. And I'm going to write the same for n minus 1. So what I do here, I multiply with n. I got an n squared, and this n is gone. And I write now the same thing for n minus 1. If this is happens for n, then I get it for n minus 1. Now if I make a subtraction, 
between those two. I get n t of n minus n minus 1 t of n minus 1 is 2 t of n minus 1 uh, plus <coughs> n square minus n minus 1 square. So this is the left side subtracted this minus this n squared minus m n squared square comes from here, and then I look at the terms I have summing up. There's a difference of two. Those sums are the same, except for one of them containing an extra term, this one up here. So that's why I get 2 times t of n minus 1. So now, what do I do about this? This in here is the same as um, t of n equals n plus 1 over n, t of n minus 1. plus 2, 1 over n. Now this is a small term, so I'm going to choose to ignore it. <coughs> and then what I get is t of n Let's see if we can follow this. N plus 1, approximately t of n minus 1. Uh, this is a little mistake here. One more step here. I'm going to call this a different recursion R of n to get the relationship R of n is approximately R of n minus 1 plus 2 over n plus 1. This is something that you should be able to solve. <laughs> what happens every time I move from n minus 1 to n, I get a harmonic term out. So this, if you iterate through it, you'll be able to solve it. And then knowing that R of n is this, you'll solve for T of n. So this is an example of recursion that we can't use any of the power tools from before. <coughs> Quiz tomorrow and Thursday, and homework's due all around. <laughs> The outline that you for what? Everything after expected, but so I just put in like.